Okay, uh, I'd like to welcome everybody uh, to the Community of Practice Gathering and uh, kick it off with a few announcements. We are recording today's gathering and we'll have the video and resources posted on the MyHEC website. Um, as with all of our events, we would like to start out with some acknowledgements. Uh, the University of Minnesota stands on the rightful homelands of indigenous people. It is their current and continued displacement that allows the university to remain today. We also at ICI like to affirm um, at our make an affirmation of commitment at ICI. We affirm our commitment to address systemic racism, ableism, and all other inequities and forms of oppression to ensure inclusive communities. Um, MyHEC um, is funded through state appropriation through the Minnesota Office of Higher Education, and that is providing the funding for today's gathering. For announcements, um, the Minnesota uh, Office of Higher Education now has a web page up on their um, website for the Inclusive Higher Education Competitive Grants. There is an RFP update uh, on the web page. Uh, I think our, our initial conversations, we were um, talking about an RFP being released in March, and that has changed, and the um, Office of Higher Ed is expecting the RFP to be available in May. Uh, the timeline is on the web page, so I encourage you to, to check there for any, any updates and we will um, also help out with that. I also wanted to mention, if you have not heard from me, um, I am connecting with all of the different college and university staff sort of teams that have been involved or connected to MyHEC. I welcome that opportunity to have a conversation to learn a little bit more about what uh, you're considering for inclusive higher ed on your campus and to gain any insight into the TA needs that you may have. If you haven't received an e email from me yet, it's in the works. Uh, for upcoming events, uh, please watch for the future uh, community of practice gathering announcements and registration. We do welcome your input and suggestions for future gathering topics. We would like that the next few months leading up to the RFP to have topics be connected um, to help support colleges and universities that would like to apply for the competitive grants. We have two uh, scheduled learning community events, February 13th and March 19th. The registration link is on our MyHEC uh, events webpage. And uh, Diane is dropping the, the link in the chat. We encourage you to uh, look at that and register. We'd also like to note that uh, nationally, Think College is offering a February 6th webinar that is on the national accreditation standards, um, along with Martha and I believe Mary um, presenting, mm -hmm. uh, they're co-presenting with Kelly Kelly from Western Carolina. And she will be talking about her experience um, with the national accreditation process uh, uh, her university is the first one to become accredited. Um, there, uh, Diane is dropping the link in the chat for the registration link for that event. In addition, I'll, I'll note it here and during the presentation, we'll drop the link in the chat. Think College is offering an online course, Becoming Accreditation Ready, and that course registration is open now through January 31st. Um, and that would be a good um, opportunity to, to learn alongside with colleagues from across the state as well as the country. And now without um, any further delay, I'd like to introduce uh, the presentation today. The national accreditation standards have been developed over many years and are designed to help colleges and universities assure that they meet quality assurance standards in the field of inclusive higher education. The standards address key areas of college and university programming related to student outcomes and individualized supports. Colleges and universities that become accredited demonstrate a level of quality programming for students with intellectual disabilities. The national accreditation also provides additional assurances to students and families about the quality of the inclusive higher education offerings throughout the country. Um, during today's gathering, we please ask that you post your questions in the chat or hold them for the Q&A portion of the day, and um, we'll get those addressed at the end of the session. 
We also invite you to stay past four o'clock where we like to continue the conversation a little less formally um, for those who are able to stay longer. And now I'd like to introduce the presenters for today. Uh, Martha Mock is uh, currently a full clinical professor in teaching and curriculum and director of the inclusive program at the University of Rochester. Martha is known for her work in college options for students with intellectual disabilities. She's also currently leading the effort to implement the national accreditation for inclusive higher education offerings across the United States. Mary um, Judge Diggert is the Associate Director of the Center for Disability and Education at the University of Rochester and has worked for the center for over 10 years. She's recently completed her doctorate in accessibility and higher education. Mary is a co-leader of the Northeast Regional Alliance for the Think College Network, a national network of colleges and leaders who work together to make colleges and universities accessible to students with intellectual disability. And finally, Mary also leads the accommodations process for all School of Education graduate students through the Office of Disability Resources at the University of Rochester. And with that, I'd like to turn it over uh, to Martha and Mary. Thanks so much, Mary, number one. Appreciate that. Um, I'm going to kick us off today. Um, thank you so much to all of you for being here um, to talk about accreditation, which um, Martha and I find really exciting and really important. Um, so we're happy to see you all here um, and happy to answer any of your questions. So uh, what I wanted to start with is um, you'll see here the two logos of Think College and National Coordinating Center and the IHEA Council. And the IHEA Council is the Inclusive Higher Education Accreditation Council, which we're gonna go into detail about later. Um, but I think it's important that everyone knows that we, the council and the National Coordinating Center work in partnership um, in developing all that, that is around accreditation, um, which is a lot. And it's really great and important work uh, and it's a wonderful partnership. So I just wanted to kind of give that context as we get started. Next slide, please. So to frame today's discussion, we're gonna talk about uh, the introduction uh, or give you an introduction to accreditation, give you an overview of the process, the standards guidance um, and what's required for review. We have a couple examples to share, practical examples for you. And then program accreditation resources that are available um, to anyone at any time uh, on the Think College website. We'll be sharing those links with you um, and giving you some examples of that as well. And then we'll have um, time for Q&A at the end. So we look forward to your questions. And next slide, please. So we, um, we're we really excited, as, as Mary um, said in her introduction, that Western Carolina University's UP program was the first program to be accredited in the nation. And that happened last year with Dr. Kelly Kelly at the helm of the program. And it was a great experience to, to do that site visit. We were also happy um, that Inside Higher Ed took an interest in this and did a very comprehensive article about accreditation and about students with intellectual disability. So if you haven't seen it, we wanted to share that with you because it really gives a great overview um, and some great information. Uh, Martha was interviewed for that as well as Kelly Kelly. And so there's great material in there to share. Next slide, please. So uh, what we'd like to do is have, um, I found it helpful really, because a lot of people had questions. Am I ready for accreditation? What do I need to be thinking about? And these are five questions that were put together to help inform accreditation. So when thinking about programs, do the students complete the program successfully and earn a credential? Does the program provide the enrolled students with supports needed to be successful in the program? Do students and families receive what they expected to receive before, during, and after students exit the program? Does the college or university support students in the program? And does the program provide exiting students with the supports they need to be successful as they go into their next step of either furthering their education or finding employment um, that is of interest to them? So these are the five initial questions that we always recommend people start with um, when thinking about accreditation and programs of inclusive higher education. Next slide, please. 
So the benefits um, of program accreditation, there are many, and we'll talk a lot about those today, but five key benefits um, that we'd like people to keep in mind is that there's a lot, it provides consistency. Um, accreditation provides quality, ongoing opportunities for improvement, um, quality assurance, and gives program offerings the opportunity to create policies if they're not already in place and receive, you know, we have peer, um, people that peer reviewers um, that are in, have been in the field for a while that are familiar with um, inclusive higher education programs. So it's a great opportunity to get feedback and guidance and support and earn some wisdom from folks that have been doing it for a while as well. So um, there's many benefits, but quality, continuous improvement, quality assurance, and having the opportunity for ongoing review um, and the ability to just continue to grow as a program by getting feedback from others and um, being also able to say that you've been accredited, a program of an inclusive higher ed for such a young field is a great opportunity. So 2008 was the passage of the Higher Education Opportunity Act. This was a really big deal because it included language that aim to increase access to students, uh, access to higher education for students with intellectual disability. And this was the first time that specific language um, had been added to the HEOA, which was really important and has a played a big role in how we're all here today having these conversations. The first accreditation committee was formed in 2011 and that accreditation committee had a big charge, a lot of work that needed to be done they needed to develop model uh, program standards, uh, which was done in 2012 and 2014. And that consisted of, you know, five years of analysis and public input and just framing how they were gonna get that public input, how they were going to analyze the standards and how they would even develop those. In 2016, the first report was sent to Congress. Because the passage of the HEOA, the Higher Education Opportunity Act, funding for the work that we do comes from the Department of Education. Um, and Congress is aware of the work and lots of reports have been sent to Congress since then. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that, explaining what the work is, uh, what work is being done and, and how the funds are being used. In 2017, they had, um, as I said, the field tested of the, mo the model standards that were developed and revisions were made based on that field test. Accreditation Agency Search. And then in 2019, which was really important, a small committee was formed, which was part of the National Work Group. And that committee went to speak to NASIKI. And NASIKI is the National Advisory Committee on Institutional Quality and Integrity with the US Department of Education. This is the agency where anyone who wants, any institution in higher ed that wants to be accredited goes through um, wants to receive Nasiki approval. And so with the presenting of the work that was being done by the committee, um, the Nasiki recommended that student learning outcomes um, be inputted and that we start to look at what student learning outcomes would be important, one, two, or more, um, that could be added to the standards and then measured through um, accreditation. And with that, a second report was then sent to Congress that had recommendations of what needed to be done next. So this brings us to present day and to, uh, to and starting in 2021, my esteemed colleague, Martha Mock, started to lead the National uh, Coordinating Center Accreditation Work Group. So this is the group that had been around for each of those phases that I just discussed. And then um, Martha came in and started to lead the next phase of that work from 2021 until uh, 2025. And so what the, that work group was charged with was to develop and pilot an accreditation process for or five program sites with those standards that the previous committees had field tested and developed and received public input on. Now those standards are in place and we're starting to um, do work with five pilot sites uh, throughout the country, um, two more to be identified, um, and then starting to put that process together. So as we said, Western Carolina University was the first program and the second and third colleges or college programs that will have site visits is the University 
of Colorado, uh, the UCCS program at Colorado Springs, and VCU, the Virginia Commonwealth University at Richmond. Um, and they'll complete the process here in 2024. And I'm going to turn it over to Martha now to talk about standards, guidance, and what's required for review. Thank you so much, Mary, for um, giving us the background and um, the important foundation that has uh, led us to this point, uh, which is you know, creating and implementing and piloting the process for accreditation. So we're honored to be doing this work alongside a number of um, individuals and programs who have uh, been going for a number of years and have offered you know high quality experiences uh, for their students at various universities across the nation. Um, next slide, please. So what I want to do in this next section is to give you a quick overview of the accreditation standard areas. And I'll highlight two of the 38 standards um, in terms of how they're structured and uh, the purpose in structuring them as such. So for those of you who have been a part of any kind of program accreditation or even institutional accreditation at your own university, uh, this process that and standards that I'm talking about and that Mary will continue on with um, will be very familiar. So in terms of accreditation, you know, we have a set of standards that um, took over about a decade to develop, and they're based on um, 10 different areas. That's what you see before you. Uh, mission, student achievement, curriculum, faculty, facility equipment, and supplies administrative and fiscal capacity, student services, length and structure of program of study, student complaints, and program development, planning, and review. So those are 10 areas that um, were identified, and they're uh, the 10 areas that are typically identified when you are um, creating program accreditation. So there's 10 standard areas, as I mentioned, and there are 38 standards that are that lie within um, those that lie within the 10 areas. Um, I'm putting in the chat. I know that uh, our colleagues from Minnesota will be uh, putting this uh, link in the chat a little bit later as well. Um, we recently uh, were working with uh, the National Coordinating Center and now have available the an online uh, 2024 guide uh, to accreditation for programs um, that serve students with intellectual disabilities. So there's three different sections in that tool. Um, the one that I'm focusing on right now is the third section, which goes through each, uh, each and every one of the 38 standards. Next slide, please. So I'm going to give you an example of a couple of the standards, the, the actual, um, structure of each standard, each of the 38, there's a standard, and then there's, uh, which is stated, um, as you see here, uh, this is mission standard one, uh, that the program has a written mission statement that is consistent with the Higher Education Act requirements, that the program is a degree certificate or non-degree program at an accredited institution, that is designed to support students with intellectual disabilities who are seeking to continue academic career and technical and um, independent living instruction to obtain competitive integrated employment. Um, so with each standard, this one being the first example, next slide please. And I will I will not read um, this whole slide to you because that's not what's most important here. What's most important is for you to understand that each standard, each of the 38 has 
guidance that goes along with it that really gives you as a program the details that you need to understand how and if you are meeting that standard. So that's really where the guidance comes in. Um, and that gives some of the nitty gritty detail. Then the third part of every standard, if we can go to the next slide, please is the required for review. And that's what we call the evidence. So, um, you know, it's fine for us as programs to go through and say, yes, we've got a mission statement or and mission and here it is, and this is how it was developed. Um, but in addition to that, what program accreditation does and what um, peer reviewers who are coming to uh, take a look at the program want to see is evidence of that. So that's what is um, what we call evidence. And um, there's a, a section for every one of the 38 standards related to required for review so that it's clear that um, programs know exactly what they need to have. There's no guesswork um, that's going on related to you know, the mission statement. So for example, with the, the mission standard uh, one, you provide the mission statement. In addition to that, you describe how the mission aligns with the Higher Education Act, um, intellectual disability and uh, CTP definitions. And by doing that, you provide the documentation that the institution where your program is, um, is accredited. So for example, um, University of Minnesota or any anyone else who is on the call that's at a nonprofit and or a public institution has been accredited. Um, and so you basically you know, provide that information about which regional accreditor has approved your institution. And in addition, uh, the required for review asks for the web link um, because, you know, what, what's a mission statement if it's not um, out there and evident to those who are participating in the program and uh, for recruitment. So that's one example of, um, you know, a standard. And that one is a, is a pretty straightforward standard um, focusing on mission. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, what I've done here is pulled out uh, an additional standard. This one is in the uh, curriculum area, and this focuses specifically on uh, curriculum standard three, which states that students with intellectual disabilities participate in a wide array of post-secondary level courses from multiple disciplines and um, departmental and college units on campus. Um, that are part of the curriculum for the degree or the certificate program. So that's the standard as it's stated. And the focus is on ensuring that um, students with intellectual disability have access to not one or two courses or uh, simply a prescribed set of courses, but to a wide array of courses at many different levels um, in a number of different departments uh, across the uh, college or institution, depending on their interest and what they're focusing on. There's other standards that focus on, that we have that are focused on um, sort of getting us to this point of selecting courses. Uh, for students, so things like person-centered planning, um, those kinds of things. But this standard in particular um, focuses on the wide array of courses. Um, next slide, please. Here again, we have the guidance for the curriculum standard, and um, I'm not going to uh, read it, but what I you know, want to highlight here again is that um, this is the way and, you know, the guidance that is given to the program in terms of taking a look at um, understanding what being able to meet curriculum standard three means. Um, I will highlight one portion of uh, this, of the curriculum standard three, which is that students spend um, at least 50% of their time in courses with non-disabled students or work settings with non-disabled 
uh, individuals as well. Um, so this is where uh, programs talk about both the wide array of access related to the disciplines that the students who are enrolled in the program have, but then also um, the fact that at least uh, at the very minimum, 50% of those of that time is spent with students um, who do not have disabilities. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, so the next slide is the required for review. This is the evidence. I'll uh, read just a couple of these. Um, all of the 38 standards are listed in the uh, link that I put in the chat um, and you can go through and read. It can be if you, I would not suggest reading them all at once necessarily. <laughs> it's one of those things that you get to know over time. Um, and as Mary mentioned, Mary, number one, uh, in Minnesota mentioned, there is a course that the National Coordinating Center has put together so that you can get to know um, the ins and the outs of the standards and uh, come to know what all of the various areas mean. Um, but for example, in curriculum standard three, uh, the first thing that's required for review is um, if restrictions exist that limit the course access for students who are in the program at the institution, that that, um, that, that policy is explained. The, pro the policy is provided and it is also explained. Um, in addition, programs need to uh, provide a list of the college catalog courses that are part of the curriculum and, and the certificate program that students with intellectual disabilities are um, are enrolled in, and that includes, um, you know, a list of the courses and a sampling of the courses that students have taken in the past. So when we're thinking about um, meeting standards and um, thinking about program accreditation, we really are looking um, for historical evidence. Um, so not only uh, when folks are going through accreditation um, and we're looking back, we're also, if you're building a program, thinking about what you're building um, that aligns with the standards. So that's one of the things that we've spent, um, you know, time talking uh, with, with uh, Mary, as well as others from across the nation when you're building programs, ensuring that they're built around the program standards that already exist. Um, in our field. All right, next slide, please. Um, so in terms of thinking about how the standards can be used now, because you may be thinking, well, gosh, I don't have a program or I have a program and, you know, I want to um, think about enhancing it or expanding it or seeing how my program measures up, one of the first things that you can do is to choose a few standard areas and um, begin with your own review in terms of thinking about what's offered for the students in your program and um, how those, uh, how those uh, match up with the uh, standards, the program accreditation standards. Um, in addition, thinking about creating or updating, <clears throat> excuse me, a program evaluation plan. So one of the things that Mary talked about, uh, Mary Judge Steiger talked about um, in the first part of the presentation was talking about quality assurance. And that's one of the things that is, um, you know, central to understanding program accreditation and central when you're central to the process when you're building a program yourself. So uh, program evaluation, ensuring that you're, you know, annually reviewing um, any kind of information or uh, information that you gather from stakeholders, for example, students, families, um, employers about your program, all those pieces fit into program evaluation. And that's one wonderful way that you can um, begin thinking about program accreditation yourself um, is thinking about program evaluation and um, creating a plan and or updating that. Um, that's the same with any program policies, procedures, or handbooks. One of the keys uh, for program accreditation, and especially in our field, um, is related to ensuring that students with intellectual disability have access 
um, to the services and uh, supports that exist on college campuses. So thinking about counseling services, thinking about advising, thinking about um, health services, all of those various areas, um, as well as, you know, if there's any kind of complaints that students need to make, um, ensuring that they know where to go to do that. So ensuring that the alignment of your program and the information that you're um, sharing with your students uh, and families as well is aligned with the um, college or university where you are. Um, so taking a look at either creating or updating um, program policies, procedures, and handbooks that you have that really focus on the program. Um, in addition, establishing a data collection system within your program. So, um, and we're going to give you and discuss some of the tools that the National Coordinating Center has worked hard to create to help support this program accreditation process that you can utilize. Um, so I'll talk about that a little bit after uh, Mary has discussed the accreditation process. Um, and then thinking about selecting systems or tools to collect data, um, yourself for accreditation. So thinking about, you know, how are you tracking uh, the number of applicants that you have? Or if you're building a program, how are you thinking about tracking the number of applicants you will have? Um, who is accepted? The admissions process, um, how students uh, matriculate into the program and how they um, complete the program and how many students graduate? What's your retention um, percentage like all of those different things, which are things that we do, you know, at the college level, um, you know, for any of our programs. And it's important for us to be doing it with um, programs for students with intellectual disabilities as well. I will turn it back over to Mary um, to talk about the accreditation process. Thanks, Martha. So the um, process is um pretty straightforward, but I don't say that lightly. I mean, it's certainly, a, you know, accreditation is work for programs and anyone else. Um, but we've really worked hard to kind of streamline it um, and um, have it done in a way that um, can be supported um, as, and manageable as possible. So you can go to the next slide. So there's four key areas. Uh, Weave is a software that we use, uh, it is created, it's a fairly new company, and Weave is created um, by educators for the purposes of education accreditation. And this site is where we have all of the standards and where programs will upload their evidence, provide narratives, um, and everything will be stored there. It's um, very similar to Google. You can have multiple people working on it from your program and it'll, it'll be live and consistently update. Um, and so we've worked closely with Weave. It was, it's been um, a very good process. And they've been really open to a lot of suggestions that we've had, which is the whole purpose of having pilot sites that as programs um, are putting in information and providing feedback on how Weave can be better, um, it's gonna be, you know, even, it's gonna be great after we're done with the five pilot sites because it'll be tweaked for, um, for our work, which is wonderful. Um, so Weave is that software. And then the self-study is what programs will do, gathering all of their evidence, writing the narrative, um, and going through what Martha just, um, with the mission standard, the example that she gave you there, um, and with curriculum standards, um, all of those standards will each be identified, and that self-study gets put together within Weave. Martha and I, as liaisons, then we'll go through that um, for the pilot sites, looking at uh, making sure links work. Um, and that the language is kind of consistent and matching and that everything got uploaded um, in a way that peer reviewers will be able to easily review. And once that self-study is submitted and we've gone through that to make sure links work and et cetera, then that's passed on to the peer reviewers. The peer reviewers are made up of a team of people that uh, work in the field um, and have a lot of experience in inclusive higher education. Some have served on the national uh, work group that we talked about earlier with the National Coordinating Center. Um, so they've been very involved in the process. Peer reviewers come together and put their plan together, how they independently review the information that was submitted in the self-study, and then they come together um, to talk about that and go to the pilot site um, for a visit for over the course of uh, a few days. 
So once that site visit happens, it's on campus. It's usually um, the peer reviewers are on campus for two full days, and then they're um, around for that week just to kind of meet and prepare to go over things, prepare for the site, conduct the site visit, and then follow up with the work that they have to do after that, which is putting a report together to give to the council. And the um, Inclusive Higher Education Accreditation Council is who ultimately determines if the program is accredited. Um, so that is uh, pretty much the, the four main key concepts of what happens um, during the process of accreditation. Next slide is the National Accreditation Work Group, which I should um, wanted to make the point earlier, um, and I neglected to do that, but the National uh, Coordinating Center Accreditation Work Group is made up of individuals um, that have been in the field for a very long time um, and that serve at pro that currently serve in programs um, that have been around for a while across the nation. Um, also, um, some, you know, uh, in addition to that, have our parents as well. Some of them are of students with intellectual disabilities as well as um, along with working in the field. Peer reviewers, um, th there are folks that um, I had said I identify, um, that we identify that work in the field that have expressed interest in being a peer reviewer. And then the IHEAC uh, liaisons, it's Martha and I. Uh, so what we do is we work with the National Coordinating Center, the peer reviewers, um, the site, and we meet with the sites and try to provide as much support as possible during the self-study process. Some sites like to meet weekly, um, other sites maybe every other week or as time goes on, we may not meet as frequently, but we're there to support them um, as they're completing the self-study with things just as I can't get this link to upload to Weave, as little as that to as big as what's this evidence going to, you know, this is the evidence we have, what does this look like? And just uh, guiding and supporting through uh, the process. Um, and also connecting with others in the field that have done the process or are experienced with it as well is another been a really good key um, role as a liaison. And then the Inclusive Higher Education Accreditation Council board members. There's four board members that you can um, learn about more about on the website. Some names I'm sure will be very familiar to you. Um, and those four board members meet to review the report given by the peer reviewers. Um, and like I said, they decide on the accreditation, not the peer reviewers. Next slide. So if you're thinking, okay, am I ready for accreditation? What do I need to do? How do I know if I'm ready to start the process? These are some questions I would ask yourselves or ask any programs um, that you are affiliated with. Is your program located at an inclusive higher education, an institution of higher ed? Um, that is accredited. So the college itself needs to be accredited. Does it meet the definition of a comprehensive transition program or CTP? The program does not need to be a CTP, but needs to meet the definition of a CTP. Does your program serve students with intellectual disability? Has the program existed for a minimum of three years and has at least two cohorts of students that have graduated? And does the program offer a credential that's issued by the Institution of Higher Ed? Next slide. And so for the council to make that determination of um, whether a program is accredited or maybe they need some more information, the peer reviewer report is taken into consideration in the program standard areas and the self-study. These three things all work together and um, are all what the, uh, the council will look at before they make their determination. Um, so our, with the peer reviewer report, they have great knowledge and understanding of the program standard areas. So how are those standard area needs being met? Um, and then looking at what the programs um, also submitted in their self-study. The next slide, please. So as I said earlier, what our next steps are is to work with the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs, which we have been over the last several months. Um, along, and at the same time as we've been working with Virginia Commonwealth University. So the UCCS program in Colorado and ACIT in college at Richmond are our next two pilot sites. Um, and we will be doing our site visits to Colorado in March. And then our site visit will be at Virginia Commonwealth University in April. Um, and then the council um, meets later on in the spring 
um, before just before summer starts um, to review all the documentation. And now I will turn it back over to Bertha to talk about um, the council in more detail. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, and thanks, uh, Mary Hoff, for putting the link in the chat as well. Um, so as the National Coordinating Center and as the, uh, at Think College, and we uh, began working together related specifically to moving accreditation forward, um, it was clear that there needed to be a um, body that was going to be making the determination related to um, whether or not a program met all of the standards and was uh, accredited. So we worked with um, our late colleague, uh, Deborah Hart, very closely, as well as with our other colleagues, uh, Kate Weir and uh, Meg Regal to launch the Inclusive Higher Education Accreditation Council. Um, next slide, please. Um, and so, the pilot site process is part of the funded work that the National Coordinating Center and the Accreditation Work Group are doing together. But the um, in order for um, an independent decision to be rendered, we needed to begin the council. Um, and the council uh, currently has four board members. It will continue to grow um, as we complete the pilot process in 2025 and um, continue on uh, with working with programs who are interested in accreditation or becoming accreditation ready, as well as um, you know, thinking about the accreditation determination. Um, so if you go to the link that uh, Mary Hoff put in the, in the chat, um, you'll find there uh, in the lower part of the website, you'll see the one program, as Mary mentioned, that we have so far that is accredited because we're right at the beginning, um, Western Carolina University. And right next to that is the um, criteria for determining accreditation um, that the council uses in order to make that decision. And uh, currently there's three different decisions that the council can make. One is that a program is fully accredited. The second is that a program is provisionally accredited, which means for a shorter amount of time, uh, three years. If you're fully accredited, it's for seven years, which is common in program accreditation. And then uh, the third is that uh, folks need to, that you're not accredited and that folks need to uh, consider reapplying. Um, our goal, of course, and our goal in this work with the pilot sites is to support folks and to continue to develop a uh, supportive process for our field, both for uh, states and programs who are um, building, as well as uh, programs that are going through accreditation um, in order for them to be successful. So there's a number of tools that um, we've that the NCC has created in order to support that effort. Next slide, please. But before we move to the tools, um, and we'll have a number of links in the um, in the chat related to the tools, I wanted to highlight um, sort of at the, towards the end of our presentation here, how and why accreditation is important to students and families. So we're all working, um, you know, and have been uh, for a number of years, along with programs across the nation, along with statewide efforts, with legislators who are, um, and, you know, and, um, TA centers like the, the one in Minnesota that are focusing on high quality opportunities for students with intellectual disabilities. Um, so we're hopeful and we know and understand that with program accreditation, uh, with this being implemented, it's going to validate and strengthen programs. That is the goal of program accreditation is that uh, students and parents will have a comparative measure so that, uh, you know, right now it's uh, word of mouth, it's what can be found on the website, um, it's attending perhaps a college fair at, um, you know, a national conference, um, but program accreditation 
as we continue to build it uh, within our field and as programs that are starting continue to build their programs around the program accreditation standards, uh, which are best practice, um, it will really you know, continue to give students and parents um, the ability to compare programs and make a choice that's the right fit for them um, and their students. Um, and students and parents can look for programs who are committed to pursuing accreditation. Um, we, we got that question at a, a, the National Down Syndrome Congress conference this summer um, when folks said, well, there's one program. So are we sending everyone to Western Carolina? And the answer is no. <laughs> the answer is there's a number of, there's you know, over 350 programs who that exist across the nation. Um, but the goal is, you know, if you're a family member or if there's a family member who is, um, you know, considering coming to your program or you're considering developing a program, is that you're thinking about pursuing accreditation, that you're building your program around um, program accreditation um, to lead to positive outcomes for students. So uh, next slide, please. So the next uh, couple slides here in our last few minutes focus on the resources that have been created by the National Coordinating Center at Think College. Next slide, please. Um, and the first page, um, there's two pages on the Think College website that relate to accreditation. One that I put in the um, chat earlier that's related to the actual activities of the work group that are occurring. Um, the other one is all of the resources uh, that Mary just put in the chat now that are focused specifically on accreditation and program accreditation. And that's the uh, screenshot that you see here of the link that Mary just put in the chat. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so there are a number of tools that you can go about utilizing right now, even if you have, don't have a program or if you're working to build a program um, or if you have a program and you're thinking about program accreditation. Um, all of these tools will be helpful to you. Um, the first one that uh, Mary mentioned earlier as well was the online course, uh, which is an asynchronous course that really helps you get to know and understand the standards and helps you prepare um, as you're either building a program or thinking about assessing your own program. Um, there's also an introduction to the program uh, accreditation standards that really gives a high level overview of them, um, as well as a self-assessment. So if you're interested in taking a look at your own program, that's what you would use. Um, and that's something that you can utilize that's been created that um, you can go through and determine whether or not how um, you know, or how you meet that standard and what you might want to do in terms of creating a plan and moving forward um, related to accreditation. And that's something we'll be talking about in the February 6th webinar that uh, Mary Hoff mentioned as well. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in addition to the um, two tools that I've talked or three things that I've talked with you about so far, which is the Becoming Accreditation Ready course. Uh, apologies, I didn't speak about these in order. Um, there's also the guide to program accreditation, which Mary uh, just put the link in the chat to. Thank you for that. That walks you through the process. It walks you through all of the standards and the guidance and the evidence. Um, there is also an evidence checklist on that tools page, as well as a system for organizing your evidence related to the 10 standard areas and the 38 standards. So all of those things have been built already um, by the National Coordinating Center at Think College in order to help move us forward as a field um, to get to know and understand and prepare for program accreditation. Next slide, please. Um, this is just a snapshot of three of the different um, three of the different 
11 modules that are in the course. So there's an introduction to the program standards and there's short um, quizzes that you can also take again and again, as well as uh, resources and background information about program accreditation. Um, and then also uh, you'll see highlighted here, the standard area, mi the mission area. Um, and then also facilities, equipment, and supplies. So Think College uh, National Coordinating Center, as well as a number of program directors from across the nation have worked to create these modules. Um, and these are just a sampling of uh, three of the 11 modules that you would be completing as part of that uh, free online course to get to know program accreditation standards. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and here is the um, link, and the deadline is actually January 30th, so, um, and the link is in the chat. If you're interested in, at all in accreditation, whether you're building a program or whether you're interested in thinking about being a peer reviewer in the future, or whether or not you're thinking about, you know, building your own, building your own program or going through program accreditation, I'd encourage you to sign up for the free, the free course um, to do that. All right, next slide, I believe, is our contact information. And um, our emails are also in the chat. And if you could, uh, let's see. And now we're moving to the uh, moderated uh, Q&A section of the discussion today. Thank you, Martha and Mary. Um, if anybody has any questions that they'd like to ask, you can certainly uh, turn your microphone on. I don't think we had anything specific come up in the chat. So we have this time um, until uh, we've got about five minutes, and then um, for people that would like to continue on, we'll have we'll continue a conversation through to about four fifteen. I'll maybe get us started if we could, uh, Martha or Mary. Could one of you talk about the um, and I I'm not sure the exact terminology, but for an uh, Institute of Higher Ed to be eligible, there's certain criteria that they need to meet in order to apply or to be eligible to apply for accreditation. Could you go over those, please? Mm -hmm. Sure, do you want me to take that, Mary? Yeah. Okay. Um, so there are um, some things that we have to think about in terms of uh, programs being ready to actually go forward with the program accreditation process. Um, and one of those is having enough information and data to provide um, and demonstrate that you do meet a standard and that you've had graduates, right? That you've successfully um, had two cohorts. So one of those criteria is having had two cohorts of students who've graduated and completed the program. Um, the other uh, is that you have a minimum of three years um, of having successfully run the program, of having admitted students and, um, you know, uh, supported them, students are successful in the program, and that they've exited. Um, so those are the minimums. Um, the other is that you have a program credential, that students are achieving a credential that is approved by your institution. So it's, um, so thinking, and it's called, you know, something different in um, every college or university, but they tend to focus, you know, around the word certificate. So either a certificate of higher education, whatever that uh, process is that students need to um, you know, whatever they're earning, whatever credential they're earning needs to have been approved by the college and university. Um, also serving students with intellectual disabilities. So it's fine if programs are broader, but when we're looking at um, specifically accrediting programs, we're only accrediting programs who are serving students with intellectual disability um, specifically. And um, 
you know, that's part of the, the Higher Education Opportunity Act that has funded all of this work. It's part of the, if you're familiar with the TIPSID network, um, that's, you know, one of the requirements there. So it's in line with that requirement. The other one is that you meet the uh, definition of a comprehensive transition program. And um, Think College has a number of different um, resources on their website. And I know that that um, CTP attainment is part of the process that um, folks in Minnesota are going to be uh, going through as well. Um, so ensuring that you meet the definition of a comprehensive transition program as part of the eligibility, and then also that your program is located at an institute of higher education that is accredited and that has not lost their own accreditation. So all of the folks on this call, I'm quite certain, meet that um, and you know are regionally accredited um, or nationally accredited um, colleges and universities. So those are the criteria that. Um, that allow that trigger, you know, if someone's interested in um, pursuing program accreditation, that all of those things need to be met first uh, before entering into the accreditation process. Thank you, Martha. Does anybody else have uh, any other questions? If not, what I'd like to do is I'd like to um, wrap up sort of our formal portion and um, we'll, so we'll, we're going to stop the recording, but then invite people to um, stay on and to um, have the opportunity to talk to Martha and Mary uh, further about any, any other specific um, topics that they would like to related to national accreditation standards. So thank you, Mary and Martha for, for being here and uh, presenting today. Sure, thank you for having us.